The purpose of the scripture reading, a lot of people don't know, a lot of the purpose of the scripture reading is to give you the general idea of what the sermon is about. And so the scripture reading today, if I don't know if you want to open the Bibles there, is from Matthew 25, it's verse 20 through 27. Matthew 25, verse 20 through 27. And it says, And he had received the five talents, came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents, sir, and I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, you good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over little, and I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also, who had two talents, came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, you good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little, and I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who had received one talent, came forward saying, Master, I knew you were a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talents in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master the answer said, you wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I did not sow, and gather where I scattered, scattered no seed. Then you ought to invest in my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was mine with interest. <laughs> Okay, that's the word here. So what I want to talk about today, I want to ask y'all, y'all ready to receive God's word? Amen. Amen. I didn't stay up all night preaching, uh, writing this word, so it's going to come real good. Um, as y'all know, I have a habit of, um, of um, naming my sermons. And if you look at the bulletin, you look at the picture, it almost kind of gives you a head start as to what I'm going to talk about. The sermon for today is actually called Discovering Your Ox Goad. Um, this is the second of a series of messages created for the purpose of developing within each and every one of us um, a kingdom mindset. However, before I go any further, I want to um, define exactly what I mean by kingdom mindset. A person that has a kingdom mindset perceives him or herself as co-workers with God in carrying out God's kingdom agenda. Now, God's kingdom agenda, for a lot of people who don't know this, is two simple things. God's first kingdom agenda is that we be reconciled with the Father through his Son, Jesus Christ. The second kingdom agenda is that mankind have dominion over the earthly realm in accordance with God's purposes and plans, and we find that in Genesis 1, chapter, um, chapter 1, verse uh, 28. This is what is meant by, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Now last week we addressed the need to always be working in building the kingdom through ministry and mission. In this message, which I, call, um, which I called used to do Christians, we talked about how churches fail uh, when we do not have a kingdom mindset. And when churches fail, the kingdom suffers. Finally, we brought to our attention that not having a kingdom mindset is sinful because it is directly disobeys Jesus' commandment that we uh, go out and make disciples of the world. Today, I want to address what uh, may be the biggest problem or the biggest stumbling block for uh, so many Christians, me probably as well as most of you, um, when it comes to reaching those who do, know, do not know Jesus. And um, what that big stumbling block is, is that we have a habit of saying, not knowing that God has already equipped us to reach those people. We got everything we need to reach everybody 
God has already assigned to you yes. to reach. I want to stress that again. You already have everything you need to reach everybody that God has assigned you to reach. And this is important because a lot of times our belief that we don't have the skill set, we don't have the mindset, we don't have the personality to reach people is what stops us from going out and doing it. God says he's ordained you to do something and when God tells you to do something, he doesn't just leave you hanging. He gives you everything you need to do it. <clears throat> this message today, as I said, is discovering your ox code. When we accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we were transformed spiritually from a servant of Satan to a child of God. But we were also transformed from a place of mental selfishness to a place where we now desire the things of God. This is why the Bible calls the Father the Lord of hosts because we have also been enlisted into the armies of God. Now, I want to get this mindset of an army there. Because a lot of Christians think that we have a requirement to be humble, we have a requirement to be to be timid, to, we have a requirement to just just allow people to walk over us. But we have been enlisted into the army of God. This is why God is called the God, the Lord of hosts. The word host means army. And if we have been enlisted in the army of God, we are soldiers. Now, if every soldier has a mindset of timidity, then no war can get won. A soldier says, I've been equipped with everything. I've been given training. I've been given the skill set. I've been given the mindset. And now my general has prepared me and placed me in a place to do a work. And they can do it. If everyday generals can do this, what do you think the Lord of Hosts can do for you? We are already equipped to do the work. So as some Christians, we follow the instructions of the commander, our Lord, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And like I said, I know some of you are going to say to yourself, I don't feel like a soldier. I don't know how to be a soldier. I don't have the skill set for being a soldier. I don't have the personality to aggressively come to someone and tell them about Jesus. I don't think I'm equipped for the war that God has placed me in. Now, the minute I say I don't think I'm equipped for the war that God has placed me in, some of y'all got mad at me and said, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm equipped. And my God has equipped me. You're right. He has. Stop acting like he didn't. Everybody sees what they're not able to do. But God is looking for people who will see, in spite of the situation, this is what I am able to do. Amen. Now, this may come as a surprise to many of you, but God built you just the way you are, with the personality you are, with the temperament you are, just the way you are, because he needed a soldier just like you. Amen. He don't want you to be a soldier like me. He wants you to be a soldier like you. And the problem with most of us is we don't know our MOS. Anybody know what MOS is? Been in the military? That's the military <laughs> occupation. What is that? Right. MOS. It's, that's, that's the, that is the thing that determines your occupation in the military. Military occupation status. And what, what that is is that job that God has assigned you to. And the reason we get this wrong is because most of us uh, think we need the job that the person across the street has. And that's not our job. There are some people in the military who are cooks. And you'll say, well, what about a cook? He's not important to the army. <laughs> you ever see a soldier fight when his, his belly hurting? <laughs> it don't look like an important job. So I want you to know, I want you to get to this place where you understand your MOS, where you understand what God has put you for, for the building of his kingdom. 
I call this finding your ox guard. Now, if you can open up your Bibles to Judges 3, verses 31. That is the only verse that is going to be a symbol of our scripture. Judges 3, 31. There's a lot of different versions. I don't care which version we get. Um, I want you to open up your Bible to that. And when you got it, say amen. amen. Now, before we read this passage, I want to give you a background. This passage speaks of the third judge, the third judge of Israel. So, or at least um, as they list them, I, I don't know if y'all know that the judges aren't actually listed in order. His name was Shimgar. The name Shimgar means sword. I've heard some pastors say the name Shimgar means one who listens to God. Um, I haven't seen it in meaning that way, so I don't tell you that. Now, during the time of Shimgar, the Philistines had been tormenting Israel. In fact, Judges 5, 6 says that the highways were abandoned because when everyone tried to take their main roads to market or to do business, the Philistines would accost them. They would rob them. They would kill them. They would torment them so that everyone that took the back roads to avoid the conflict. In modern day's terms, we would say they took the back roads because they were scared. Now I need you to understand that this is not where this is this was not the Philistine army that had um, decreed war against Israel. These were Philistine thugs. They were a small group of thieves and bandits and gangs that would position themselves at major intersections of the highways. And when people would bring their wares to market, they would jump out, take their wares, beat them, attack them, and do whatever they wanted to. <coughs> now the scripture says, and I'm reading from Judges 3.31, says, after him, the him they're talking about is Ehud, which is the second judge of Israel, after him was Shimgar, the son of Anath, who killed 600 of the Philistines with an ox goad. And he also saved Israel. That's the whole verse. There's a whole lot in that. There's a whole lot in that. At first glance, it appears to be a short passage. But from this passage, we're going to exegete some very powerful things that we need if we're going to prepare ourselves as soldiers for the building of God's kingdom. From this passage, we're going to exercise steps that will allow you to do great things for God. But here's the kicker. If you follow these steps in your everyday life, you're going to find you have able to do great things for yourself. So by following God's plan, you will be able to experience life, but as the Bible says, not just life, but life more abundantly. Does that sound like something anybody here wants? Amen. Amen. Now here's the only problem here. The steps will backfire if you try to use them for yourself. God has put a special thing on these steps. Proverbs 16 tells us that when we do these steps which are pleasing to God, God will even make our enemies get along with us. Now the first thing I need you to realize especially those who say you are not a soldier or, 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 or you don't know how to be a soldier for God, is that Shimgar wasn't a soldier either. As a matter of fact, the scriptures allude to the fact that Shimgar was a farmer. But what would he, he was able to do great exploits for God because he was trained in the skills of a soldier? No. He didn't know nothing about soldiers. He didn't have no sword. He, he didn't have no shield. What he knew how to do was plow. Shimgar could plow a field. You went to your field plow? That's who you went to. He had perfected the art of plowing. 
So what I want to say, say to you, you don't have to be trained as an evangelist to do great work for God. You don't have to have the knowledge of some theological man to do great work for God. You don't have to have a background of deep Christian doctrine to do great things for God. You have to realize that God has already equipped you with what you need to do great things for God. Jesus tells the parable of the talents. We read that earlier. Starting in verse 20, we read, And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing the five talents more, saying, Master, we delivered, you delivered to me five talents, but here I have made five talents more. And the master said to him, Well done, you good and faithful servant. Servant, you have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And also you have the one with two talents who came forward. Master, you delivered me two talents here, and I have made two talents more. And his master said to him, well done, you good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. But when we read the last verse, we find that there was a servant who took the talent that was given to the master, and he buried it in the ground. And his master didn't say, thanks for the talent that I gave you. He said to him, you wicked and slothful servant. In this story, the talents is the gospel. And God is saying to those who share the gospel and multiply the kingdom, enter into the joy of your master. But to those that have the gospel, who God has given and take that gospel and bury it into ground and keep it for themselves and don't share it with anyone. What God is saying to you, you wicked and slothful servant. <clears throat> I want y'all to understand this. The first thing we need to know if we want to get to great things for God is to start where we are. Did anybody hear what I said? Amen. To start with, I want y'all to say this with me. The first thing I need to do if I want to do great things for God is to start. Start where I am. Okay, somebody, let's try this again. The first thing I need to do if I want to do great exploits for God is to start where I am. Start where I am. Do you need a master's degree in theology? No. Do you need a years of training as an evangelist? No. Whatever you need, God has already equipped you with it. Amen. Start where you are. Amen. Okay. Now the second thing we're going to get from the pastors in Judge 3, 3 is that Shimgar was not equipped to be a soldier. He didn't have soldierly skills. As a matter of fact, Scripture says Shimgar defeated 600 Philistines with an ox goat. Now the ox goat is a farmer's tool. It's a farmer's tool. And the reason Shimgar used the farmer's tool was because he was a what? He was a farmer. That's what farmers use, farmer tools, right? And he was using what he had, okay? For those that don't know, an obstacle is an eight feet long pole. And at the end of it is a little point. And some obstacles have a little hook at the back. Now the point is, when you're plowing and the ox decides it's time, you take that goat and just poke him in the back of his leg, and he'll move over. It motivates the ox. The hook is when you're plowing, sometimes rocks and stuff get stuck in there. And he takes that goat and jams it in the ground, and he pulls those rocks out the way. And he throws them in the back so that the ground is, is, is tilled correctly. So Shemgar didn't have a sword to defeat the 600 uh, Philistines. There's no indication that he had even any idea how to use a sword. But what he did know was how to use an ox goat. And he'd been using an ox goat for years to tend to his crops. And with the tool that God had allowed him to perfect, he was able to raise up from a farmer to a judge, a leader of a whole country. I know the story about another little boy. I don't know if y'all ever heard of him. His name was David. 
This little boy got in a battle with a man nine feet tall named Goliath. Goliath was tormenting the people of God. 1 Samuel 17 says the weight of Goliath's coat of arms, his armor, was 500 shekels. That's about 125 pounds. Mm. And when you count up his, his, his coat of armor and, and, his, and his knee brace and his shield and all that, some deep theological person came up and said it was about 700 pounds total weight mm -hmm. of armor. But David didn't take the first lesson in military engagement. Mm -hmm. He had no idea how to be a soldier. When Saul tried to adorn David in the military armor, it didn't even feel good on him. Mm -hmm. David said, get this stuff off of me. I don't know what this stuff is. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to use this. <coughs> what David used was a slingshot. I want to tell y'all something. A slingshot is a boy's toy. Mm -hmm. David didn't use a sword because he wasn't equipped to use a sword. He didn't take he didn't consider his military background because he didn't have any military background. There's something that God has allowed you, each and every one of us, some skill God has allowed us to perfect, some occupation God has put us in, some tools that God wants us to know that we can use for the building of his kingdom. Amen. Some of us are skilled in communications. You know, they, you know what they call someone skilled in communication? They say, he got the gift to gab. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I want you to know that God has built you that way. Amen. It wasn't by accident that you got the gift to gab. Mm -hmm. Some of us has a, guilt, a gift of compassion. Mm -hmm. When we hear someone's problems, we can feel it. We can, we can, we can show compassion towards it. And that draws people to us. I want you to know that God has built you that way with that guilt, gift of compassion. Not every one of us is going to be an evangelist. But God wants every one of us to evangelize. Not every one of us is going to be a preacher, but God wants all of us to tell somebody about Jesus. Not every one of us are going to be a teacher. And here's something I need you all to understand. What you know right now about Jesus is enough Amen. to tell somebody about Jesus. Amen. What we have to understand is God has equipped us with something in our life. Something, if you might be someone who can sing, and God is saying, can you use that voice for my glory? Hallelujah. You might be equipped with someone who can draw, and God says, can you, can you make those drawings for my glory? Amen. Every one of us got an ox goat Amen. that God is asking us, God is requiring us to use for his glory. Amen. So here's what we need to do. You need to say to yourself, or say to God in prayer, God, you have given me this gift, and I don't know what that gift is God has given you. You know what that gift is. Here's a hint. There's something you can do that you can do better than everybody else. There's something you can do that you can do better than everybody else. Let me tell you a story, and this is off on the side. There is a guy um, who I listen to his music all the time. His name is Shy Men. He's a rap artist. He's a Christian rap artist. He actually has a church in West Philadelphia. Shy Men loved rap, but couldn't figure out how he could use rap for the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Today, he's considered the foremost Christian rapper in the world. Mm -hmm. The very thing that had, most of the time, rap has been considered nothing or the antagonist to God. He's used that gift that he had to build God's kingdom. Amen. Every one of us got a gift we can use for God's kingdom. Yeah. And what we need to say to is, God, I know you've given me this gift now. Now show me how I can use it Amen. to build your kingdom. Amen. God, I know you've given me this talent. Now show me how I can use it to build your kingdom. Amen. God, I know you've given me this occupation. I know you've given me this, this skill. I know you've given me this desire. Whatever it is, show me how I can use it to build your kingdom. Amen. Let me tell you a story. I love this story. It's a story about this missionary tells this story. Uh, about when he was in Africa. He had a mission in Africa, 
and he, there was a woman, an elderly woman, who had received the gospel. And she gave her life to Jesus Christ. Now what makes this special is this woman was blind and illiterate. She had never read because she was blind. Hmm. But what she wanted to do is share her newfound faith with someone. Amen. She went to the ministry one day and asked for a copy of the Bible in French. And when, it, when she got the Bible, she asked the missionary, could you underline John 3.16 for me? Mm. And he underlined John 3.16 and read it for her. And he said, can you bend the pages back? Because she was blind, she couldn't find the pages. Mm. And he did that. And every day at about 2 o'clock, she would leave the mission and she would walk out. Mm. And about 5 o'clock, she would return. And the missionary wondered where she went every day, Monday through Friday. She would leave and she would return. So rather than ask her, he said, the next time she leaves, I'm going to follow her. It's easy to follow a blind person. <laughs> so he followed her and found out she went to a nearby boys' school. And when the school let out at 3 o'clock, she would walk over there with her cane. And some boy would address her and she would say, can you do me a favor? And I would say, yes. She said, can you read French? And of course it was a boys school so all of them could read, right? <laughs> so she said, they would say, yes. She said, can you, op she would open up the book to where it was, in John 3, 16. And say, can you read that verse for me? And when they read that verse, she would ask him, do you know what that means? And she shared the gospel with him. Hmm. She did this for about six years. Hmm. In six years' time, over 24 pastors said they came to Christ because of her. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. I'm going to pass this story. The elderly woman didn't see her, her affliction, her blindness, as a reason to not share the Bible. Hmm. What she seen was her affliction as a way to share the Bible. Mm -hmm. Amen. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. She didn't make excuses. She made plans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some of you have made the excuse, I don't speak well. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I'm not equipped to witness to others about Jesus. The Great Commission is given to everyone. And what we need to understand is Jesus did not require us to proclaim the gospel unless he, we were able to proclaim the gospel. Amen. Hallelujah. Some of you said, I don't have the gift of an evangelist. And I've tried to share the gospel, but no one ever responds. I know when I first tried to share the gospel about eight times, uh, one guy threatened to hit me. <laughs> I'm like, this... They didn't explain that to me. <laughs> but a lot of us think that we're not given the gift of evangelism because we weren't given the gift of evangelism. We shouldn't be sharing the gospel. Have y'all ever heard of a prophet named Jeremiah? You see, Jeremiah lived for 80 years. For 80 years, he had an 80-year ministry. And during that 80-year ministry, Jeremiah did not convert that one person to God. Amen. Zero. Yet, Jeremiah and the book of Lamentations are written about him. The difference between Jeremiah and a lot of us is Jeremiah understood something that we're completely missing. And that is, as I said earlier, you and I are co-workers with God in the kingdom, Amen. building the kingdom. Amen. You see, first, God prepares the heart of the sinner to, to uh, receive the proclaimed word. In Ezekiel 3, 36, 26, it says, God says of building his kingdom, he will take a stony heart and replace it with a heart of flesh, and he will put his spirit in us. Mm -hmm. 
Hmm. Our responsibility is that, like Jeremiah knew, we just proclaim. God does the converting the heart. We do proclaiming the gospel. Yes. A lot of us say, I proclaimed the gospel and nobody came. That's not your job. <laughs> your job is to proclaim. We've heard God is the one that does the saving. He's the one that does the converting of the heart. Amen. Amen. This is why Paul says, now, I want you to understand the power of proclaiming the gospel. The gospel, Paul says, is so powerful that when God has prepared the heart, it can do supernatural things. Amen. And there's a the problem with proclaiming the gospel. A lot of people think the gospel is telling people what God has done in your life. And that's good. But that's your gospel. We're talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hmm. Paul says the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God unto salvation. It is the power of God. Now I want you to understand what I'm saying. When we are proclaiming the gospel, we are using this very same power that separated the Red Sea and allowed over a million Jews to walk through dry land. Amen. That's the gospel. When we are proclaiming the gospel, we are using the same power that allowed three Jewish boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, to get in a burning furnace and not get burnt. Amen. When we proclaim the gospel, we're using the same power that, that allowed Jesus to heal Peter's mother, that allowed Lazarus to rise from the dead after four days, even though it made common sense that he wouldn't, because as his boss has said, his body stinking. Amen. Yet we think the gospel is something we shouldn't proclaim. Mm -hmm. Listen, it's not us that bring people to God. Right. It's the gospel. Amen. Right. Amen. Proclaim it. Do, do you know why Shimgar and David were successful in this? In, 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 in doing what the great things they did for God? It was not because of the skills they had to develop with the tools they had. A lot of people get this wrong. I'm sure there was formers out there that used the uh, ox code better than Shimgar. I don't think it's a stretch of imagine to believe there were some shepherd boys that could use a slingshot better than David. But here's their secret. In 1 Samuel 17, 26, David asked a question that's a deal breaker. And until we get into that mindset where we can understand this question, we're not going to be successful in doing great exploits for God. David says, Who is that uncircumcised Philistine that will come against the army of God? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> let, me, let me help you out with this. David said, who is that uncircumcised Philistine that will come against the army of God? That's a powerful secret. Y'all don't understand. Mm -hmm. Let me help you out with this. David believed God so powerfully that he believed, even if I stepped out believing God is going to take have my back when I come against this giant, God is going to have my back. Amen. For those who are afraid to give the gospel, you need to know, even if you don't know the words, the, the right gospel, the right doctrine to share Jesus with, Jesus is going to have your back. Amen. Amen. You need to say to the devil when he says to you, don't witness to this one, who are you, you uncircumcised Philistine, Amen. that you will come against? A soldier of God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. <clears throat> we need to know that that power is power in the word. Amen. So let's do this. I want to get these steps down to you. I want you to understand. So let's see what we have so far. If I plan to do great things for Jesus, I have to first what start where I am. Y'all help me out. I need to start where I am. I don't need a phil any philosophical training. I don't need any theological classes. Yeah. I don't need to be confident God is going to divinely send people. I need to start where I am. The second thing I need to do is use what I have. Mm -hmm. Use what I have. There is some ox gold 
something you do better than everybody else Amen. that you need to use for God's kingdom. Amen. First thing, start where I am. Second thing, use what I have. There's one more step. You're going to have all the secrets you know. Now, I want to bring to you this very thing. The, 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 the world today knows these steps. Christians don't know these steps. Think about Serena Williams. The first day she grabbed the tennis racket, she wasn't that good at it, was she? Mm -hmm. But she played tennis. <coughs> and she used what she had. What did she have? A tennis racket. Mm -hmm. And now she's one of the highest paid women in the world mm -hmm. with that tennis racket. And now she has a clothing company with that tennis racket. She didn't go out and try to get some deep business class. She started with what she had and she used. She started where she was and she used what she had. Christians gotta know that. Start where you are, right here, right now. You don't need anything special. And use what you got. Some God has either given you a talent for, given you a mindset for, or something you can do. It can even be your occupation. Should we see it in this story? It can be your affliction. Mm. Start where you had, are. Use what you have. Amen. Amen. The scriptures tells us in Judges 15, 14, and 16 that the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon Samson. Y'all remember that guy? This big, strong guy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Long hair. And he broke away from the new ropes that the Philistine had bound him in. And he picked up a jawbone of a donkey and he killed 1,000 men. Mm. Now before Samson killed a 1,000 men with the jawbone of a donkey, Shemgar had already killed 600 men with an ox code. But how did these great feats how, they, how he did these great feats are totally different. The scripture tells us that Samson killed them heaps upon heaps. That means he was killing people and throwing them up on top of each other. Killing the people and throwing them up on top of each other. Killing people and throwing them up on top of each other. Samson was endowed with a supernatural power. The body, Bible says that the Holy Spirit would come upon him and he would do great things. But Shimgar was just a regular farmer. Shimgar was sort of like you and I. He was doing just enough to get by every day. He was living his life, probably trying to take care of his family, just doing. But how did he elevate? How was God elevating him to the position of judge over a country? Shimgar didn't have any supernatural strength. He wasn't stronger or faster than the 600 people he defeated. Do you remember the, the, the background I gave you on what was going on? It said the tormentors were not the Philistines' army. This was a bunch of Philistine thugs. Remember I said that? They're a small group of thieves and bandits and gangs they would position themselves in major intersections. And when the farmers came by going to the market, they would ambush them. What I think happened, and the Bible doesn't tell us, this is just my personal opinion. Y'all can take it or you can leave it. What I think happened is Shimgar got tired of the thugs taking what he worked for. Mm -hmm. Shimgar got tired of his family and friends being unable to travel to the marketplace on the main roads. So one day, Shimgar with his ox goat laid in ambush for the thugs who were laying in ambush for someone else. Mm -hmm. So when the Philistines thugs jumped out to ambush the Israel farmers, Shimgar ambushed them. Mm -hmm. And I can imagine he may have took out two or three today and took out three or four the next day and took out five or six the next day. 
How many of y'all remember the movie Batman Returns? I love that movie. In the beginning of the movie, something unique happens. The thieves and the thugs are afraid to go out at night because of the Batman coming. And that's the same thing that's happening to the Philistines. The thuggy, bad people of the Philistine, they were afraid to get on those main roads because they knew Shimgar was traveling up and down that road. <laughs> And so what happened, he would take out one here, and he would take out two there, and he would take out three there. And when they counted up, when they did a body count of the graves of the, of the, of the subs that Shimgar had killed, it was around 600. And you want to know what was unique? The roads were clean. As a matter of fact, Deborah, who was the fourth uh, judge of Israel, sings a song that says, in the days of Shimgar, where the roads were difficult. And then she tells about how Shimgar cleared those roads. And people were having to take their food to marketplace. Hmm. What the point I'm trying to get across to everyone here is we don't have to try to do great things for God. Just do a little here. And do a little there. Speak to someone this day. Tell somebody about Jesus that day. Invite your neighbor to church the next day. And before it's over, when they count up the bodies of those who you have spoken to, they're going to say, you've done great exploits for Jesus. Amen. Amen. The third thing we need to point, let's go through these three steps. The first thing we need to do, if we want to do great things for Jesus, and if we want to change our lives, is to first start where we are. Mm -hmm. The second thing is well, we use have. what you have. Yes. And the third thing is, do what you can. Amen. The Bible says in Proverbs 6, God will honor you. Amen. And even your enemies will become your friends. Amen. That's my word. Amen. Let's stand up. Amen. I hope this word really reached you. And, 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 and it did something to bring us to a debt understanding that we are already equipped to do great things. There's none of us that's not skilled enough to meet someone. God is saying, go out into the nations and make disciples of the world. It's called the Great Commission, not the Great Suggestion. We don't have that option. It's expected of us. And all we have to do is believe that when we give the gospel, it is the power of God unto salvation. Amen. That just by telling people about Jesus, the very words are so powerful that they will come. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this opportunity to hear this word. And Father, we ask with all our hearts that to give us boldness to speak. Even Paul spoke of praying for boldness to speak your word. Father, we believe that you have, have anointed us and saved us, not just for our own self, that we would take the gospel and we would bury it into our own hearts, but that we would share it and multiply it. And that you would do all that is necessary to grow your kingdom. Father, we are co-workers with you in the building of your kingdom. We have a mindset for a kingdom agenda, which is the salvation of all of mankind and the dominion over all things. And we thank you, dear Heavenly Father. Give us strength to be not just hearers of the word, but doers of the word. As we walk in our light as co-workers with you in the building of your kingdom. Amen. 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 And dismiss.